Uh, welcome everyone to the latest of our virtual events and the latest in the Jean and John Rowe program series, My America, Immigrant and Refugee Writers Today. The exhibit that accompanies this series opened at our Chicago Museum in November and opened online in the spring at my-america.org. At that site, you can see the stories from writers from 18 different countries talking about family, connection, influence, how and why they came here, and what it means to them to write as an American. Just a few short housekeeping things before we begin tonight. As you're watching this conversation, if you have a question that you'd like asked, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We're monitoring that for questions at the end of this, and we may contact you via the chat to ask your question yourself. My name is Allison Sansoni. I'm the program director at the American Writers Museum. If you like the kinds of online programs you see from us, you can become a member and get advance notice of special events and offers, including behind the scenes tours and lots of other good things to keep you very busy during this strange time. Our YouTube channel has videos posted of programs from the last three years. You can check that as well for news and updates. It also includes our most recent live benefit broadcast, Onward 2020, which gives you more details about our education programs and how you can support the AWM. Our book selling partner, both when we're open and here online, is Seminary Co-op Bookstore. And you can order online from them or from our bookshop.org page as well. We're grateful to all of you for being here and for valuing the past, present, and future of American writing. Our guest tonight is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Separated, Inside an American Tragedy, which details the impact on families and children of decades of immigration laws at the southern border, culminating in the Trump administration policy of separating asylum-seeking parents from their children. Jacob Soberoff is a correspondent for NBC News and MSNBC. For his reporting on the child separation policy, he received the 2019 Walter Cronkite Award for Individual Achievement by national journalist and the 2019 Hillman Prize for Broadcast Journalism. He's appeared on Today, Morning Joe's, The Rachel Maddow Show, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, and numerous other programs. He co-presented with Katie Turr the four-part event docuseries American Swamp on MSNBC, and he's joining us now from, Jacob, you were telling me offline, your laundry room slash studio. Welcome. Hey, Allison, welcome to my laundry room. Uh, <laughs> right behind that door is the stacked washer and dryer. And I hope that it's not on. I have earphones in, so I can't hear right now, but I don't think that it is. Well, thank you for, for joining us in these these strange times. And, and we appreciate you- Here's the proof, the by the way. talk with us about the important well, subject. <laughs> thank you, there it is important, go. but I just want to prove to you that this is the laundry basket. That's um, Thank you, thank you for having me here. And I'm just, I'm only sorry I couldn't be uh, in Chicago in person. Well, thank you for, for coming. I, you know, in reading your book, I, I first wanted to ask you how you came to the story. You know, you, you detail really early on that this wasn't something necessarily that you had set out to cover, but you ha kept coming back to it. What, um, how did you find your way to the story? Well, you're right. I, I consider myself, I guess, an unlikely um, eyewitness to what turned out to be one of the most shameful chapters in modern American history, if not the entire history um, of this country. And that's because, you know, while I was covering a lot of border issues um, for MSNBC and NBC News, really for me, that meant, is President Trump lying? Is he lying about you know, the need for a border wall? Is he lying about where drugs are coming in? Uh, is he telling the truth about how many MS-13 members are coming into this country? Um, or is the border dangerous? You know, things like that. And, you know, I always, always enjoyed and found important covering issues related to immigration as a person uh, native to Los Angeles. I grew up here um, and born and raised here. And it's a city that's uh, over 50% people of color at this point. Um, and so those issues are unavoidable uh, to somebody who lives in a city like this one, and particularly to a journalist that lives in a city like this one. Um, but family separation was never on my radar. And I write a lot about how in the book, and I detail many times, quite frankly, where I just missed the story. And it was not until uh, June 13, 2018, uh, after quite some time, months of working on a Dateline NBC documentary about uh, the reality of life along the border that I was invited by 
Kirsten Nielsen's press secretary, a woman named Katie Waldman, who ultimately became Katie Miller when she married uh, Stephen Miller, the president's advisor, uh, to tour this facility. Um, Casa Padre, uh, the former Walmart, 250,000 square feet in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, and that is where, uh, for the first time, really family separation smacked me right in the face. And I saw 1,500 boys, 10 to 17 years old, um, hundreds of them who had been separated uh, and were there for no other reason than that, living for 22 hours a day inside, uh, doing Tai Chi and watching Moana, the movie in the loading dock of the former Walmart and standing in line to eat food. And, and sorry for the long answer, but I mean, basically it was at that moment when I walked outside and I told my colleague, Chris Hayes, and many of the people watching us right now may have seen that moment live, you know, I've been inside jails in a prison. This place is called a shelter, but effectively these children are incarcerated inside. Uh, and it was from there that I started to realize um, there is so much more about this that I frankly missed. And Julia Ainsley, my colleague, didn't miss it. Caitlin Dickerson at the New York Times didn't miss it. Lomi Creel at the Houston Chronicle didn't miss it, now at ProPublica, but I did. And that's why I wanted to write the book. There was so much that I did. I became associated with covering this policy because I was one of the first journalists to actually set eyes on the living conditions of these children in custody. But there was so much that I didn't know about this. And so even after the fact, even two years after the fact. And so that's why uh, in the summer of 2019, a year later, I set out to write this book uh, to answer questions that I couldn't, couldn't answer for myself. Tell me a little bit about your, your research process um, and how it differed you know, from, from the research that you do when you're reporting. Well, it, it's interesting. In it all, <laughs> this was never intended to be a writing project. Um, I was never a writer, never considered myself a writer. I always considered myself a broadcast journalist. But it all kind of started unintentionally the minute I walked into that Walmart where I had to pull over on the way there because this was a patent paper only tour, no cameras allowed. Um, and I pulled over at a Walmart. I bought a little tiny, actually, hold on a second. I think I have it. Hold on one second. A tiny blue notebook. Where's my, where's my binder down here? I wish I could show it to you. Um, it's probably the first time anybody's ever do do jumped out of frame in order to find something. In your it's series. actually not. But <laughs> is that true? That's hilarious. I don't know where that binder is. It just goes to show you how disorganized I am. I'll find it later. Hold on. Do I have, oh, there it is. Hold on. So this is my, you know what? I'm gonna take you with me, check this out. This is really my laundry room. And this is what it looks like under the desk here in my laundry room. And this is the binder that I used when I was researching my book. Okay. So I, let me plug this in. I'll put this back behind me, but this is the binder I used when I was researching and writing the book. Um, and this is the little blue notebook that I that I picked up at um, a Walgreens in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, and inside it are um, the notes that's, that started this as a writing project when I didn't even know it. And I, I mean, I write things here and this is all in the book too. I mean, I write about all this in the book, but um, let me flip through and read some of it to you. So it says here, I don't know if you can read my writing, but kids everywhere, Oreos, applesauce, smile at them. They feel like animals in a cage being looked at. Um, and that was, a, that was a representative of Casa Padre, uh, which was run by Southwest Key, which is the, the shelter operator. And it was, that was weird to me because there were no cages in that facility, but everybody had been talking about kids locked up in cages. And just to get back to um, the writing process, um, I had no choice but to write down what I saw uh, because there were no cameras allowed. And so when I was a, ultimately approached, or I guess approached not the right word, but once I ultimately had a conversation with my editor, Peter Hubbard at HarperCollins about doing this project, uh, it was the first thing that I did. And the whole um, introduction, introduction to the book actually is me going back to my storage unit, um, a five minute drive away from here at a public storage, looking through all my stuff, um, digging out from under like a changing table and Christmas decoration, baby change table and Christmas decorations and a pendant lamp and all kinds of stuff to find that notebook. And that's the spine of the book. What I wrote in that book in the Walmart and then in um, the McAllen Ursula Central Processing Station seven days later or less than seven days later on Father's Day 2018. And then 
uh, inside a federal courtroom in San Diego. I mean, those are the stories that I started with when I began writing what, um, what became this. The, the other narrative through line of the, the book is really, you know, the story of, of a father and son that you met, uh, Juan and Jose, um, sure, sure. who had been who had been separated and the book sort of follows them through this through this process. What how was connecting with them? What was that like for you as a reporter and how did you sort of gain their trust and establish that rapport that let you get so far into their lives? Sure. And I don't think this really spoils the, the story in the book, but ultimately what you'll see is there's three real narrative strands of the book. One is mine as a reporter kind of missing and then learning about the story. The other is government officials, um, both who were trying to stop this policy from happening and also who implemented it. And the third is Juan and Jose. Um, and I first, I, I, their story starts at the beginning of their story um, in Petén, Guatemala, when they were threatened by narco traffickers and decided to leave. Um, but my story with Juan started actually when I met him after he was separated from his son for almost five months. And I met him in person inside the Adelanto Ice Processing Center in the high desert of Southern California, about two hours from where I'm sitting right now. And I drove up there and he had been coerced into signing away the right to reunify with his son. And he was one of, I think about a dozen in that facility um, who was in that situation. And were it not for his lawyer, Lindsay Toslowski at the Immigrant Defenders Law Center, um, he probably would have been deported like 400 plus other parents without their children because he had been coerced into doing so. Um, and so when it comes to how did I build the, build his trust, it was more that we just started a relationship when he was detained. And I learned about him then. It wasn't about writing a book. It was about sharing his story with the general public at the time as a reporter on television so that, you know, potentially his case could be reversed. The documents he signed could be thrown out and he could get to see his son who was thousands of miles away in South Texas, not far from where I toured that border patrol station. And I met him again, um, I guess it would be in October, went right before he was gonna be reunited with his son on the streets of downtown LA. Um, and then uh, again, um, I guess we just kept in touch via text. And, and over the process of writing this book, I went out to see them where they now live in Washington, DC. I've been actually working on American Swamp, the documentary series you had mentioned with Katie Turr. And so while I was there, I started to just go out to dinner with them. And we would go to this chain, I write about this a little bit too in the book, we would go to this chain steakhouse in the DC area and we just started talking. And when I told him that I wanted to include his story in the book and I asked him if it was okay, both of them, Juan and Jose, um, he said yes. And his, his um, the reasons that he decided to participate and allow me to tell a story, and I should say that their, their names were changed, but, but that's about it, um, is that he wanted to learn the same answers. He had the same questions I did. How did this happen? And how can we prevent it from ever happening again? And when I say it, you know, I really want to be specific. American Academy, Academy of Pediatrics called this government sanctioned child abuse. What happened to him and his son? Um, Physicians for Human Rights, which won a Nobel Peace Prize for their work on landmines, called this torture, what the American government did. And so um, we shared a goal of learning more about how this could have ever happened. It's why I call the book Separated Inside an American Tragedy, because that's really what this is. The government perpetrated this. It wouldn't have been possible, um, certainly because of the Trump administration, but also because of uh, many administrations before this. Um, and so we set out to answer these questions together. And his way of doing that was by by opening up to me, both of them. And, and we got together many times, three, I think at least three times um, as I was writing this book to sort of go through every detail, FaceTime with his family back in, in Guatemala. I traveled to Guatemala as I reported this story um, and wrote the book. Um, and they, they've now come to be a people I care a lot about. When you, let's talk a little bit about the third through line that you mentioned, which is that, you know, these government officials who were, you know, in some cases trying to prevent the policy from being implemented in other cases were sure that this would be an effective deterrent against right. people seeking asylum. What I was struck with when I was reading the book is just how often those who wanted this policy implemented, even as they denied there was a policy, just how often they told on themselves. You know, you, you mentioned a couple of times that, you know, they, they blew the whistle on themselves. They 
how did that, you know, tell us a little bit about that and, and what that was like. Well, what's interesting about family separations is that um, it didn't, as a systematic policy to separate thousands of children, it started in the Trump administration, but the, the practice itself on a limited basis was occurring during the Obama administration. And in fact, there were NGOs that were warning as the Trump administration was coming in about the fact that this was something that happened from time to time. And that if it got basically into the wrong hands as a practice, it could be truly disastrous. And so there was a guy in the Office of Refugee Resettlement at the beginning of the book, you can read all about him. His name is Jim De La Cruz. And he was a federal field specialist, basically a frontline social worker who wrote in an email, the best way to not the best way to avoid issues with reuniting parents and children is to not separate them uh, in the first place. And despite that type of advice from sort of career people who had the best interests of the children at heart, on Valentine's Day 2017, right after Donald Trump became the President of the United States, uh, they all met in the conference room of Kevin McAleenan, the Acting Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection, sort of talking about doing this. Um, people left shell-shocked that were holdovers from the previous administration. And over the course of months that became a year, um, there continued to be all these warning signs. And in particular, there's a couple of people who I think um, are important to highlight. Commander Jonathan White, um, a career civil servant from the U.S. Public Health uh, Commission Corps, which, are, which actually are people that deal with natural disasters for the most part and sort of healthcare crises. Um, but he was saying when he was in ORR, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, if this separation policy happens, and remember John Kelly in 2017 said on CNN, yeah, we're considering it. If it happens, we're gonna run out of bed space. This is potentially traumatic to the children. Claire Trickler McNulty within ICE, um, again, a career employee uh, had said, this could be abusive to the children. The idea of the systems not being able to talk to each other if they're separated could be disastrous and could create a situation where these children are abused. And at every twist and turn, and this goes back to like things I didn't know at the time. I kept saying, there's no plan. They have no way to reunite. This is a huge man-made disaster. I was right in that it was a disaster. But I was wrong in that there was no plan to reunite. Um, there were career officials who almost at every opportunity tried to stop this from happening. It was the Trump administration officials um, who kept pushing back and kept pushing forward. And there are many stories, read chapter five, get rid of the list where Scott Lloyd uh, who was the Trump appointed head of Office of Refugee Resettlement, his first instinct was when the list of 700 people at, who had been separated leaked out to Caitlin Dickerson at the Times, his first instinct was not to call DHS and say, hey, I'm responsible for 10,000 plus kids in the custody of the federal government. What in the hell is going on? He instead, uh, his subordinates understood it to be, uh, gave them an instruction to get rid of the list, to destroy the list, the critical linkage that Jim De La Cruz kept that could have been used to reunite parents and children. And so when you say they blew the whistle on themselves, there were many times where they let this out, this information out. Um, but the Trump administration kept pushing forward because they saw political advantage to ending so-called catch and release. The idea that people who came here for asylum shouldn't be able to wait inside the country and instead should either be locked up indefinitely or kicked out of the country immediately. Um, and they thought family separations was gonna be the way to effectuate that policy change. How did they imagine the information of what was happening? This is something that's puzzled me since, you know, since the news first broke. Sure. How did they imagine the information was going to get to desperate people fleeing narco traffickers that if you go to the border and seek asylum, bad things will happen to you? Trickle, trickling back through word of mouth, I suppose. But what is perplexing, uh, maybe perplexing is too generous. What is, I guess the generous interpretation would be perplexing. The, 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 the more sinister or cynical interpretation would be sort of diabolical way to look at this is, we know deterrence, and that's what this is, a deterrent-based strategy. The idea of scaring people from coming doesn't work. It didn't work when Bill Clinton did prevention through deterrence on the border in 1994, building walls that would send migrants through quote unquote hostile terrain, read the memo in the book. Um, it didn't work when George W. Bush created DHS and exponentially increased the size of the border patrol. It didn't work when Barack Obama 
became the so-called deporter in chief and deported more people than any president in history. Uh, and again, were it not for all of those deterrence based failed policies, people still kept coming to this country, um, Donald Trump wouldn't have been able to do family separations. But there is a belief amongst, again, generous would be a belief, um, cynical would be, uh, you know, ill intent amongst people in immigration law enforcement that scaring the crap out of people, harming people, um, will make le uh, other folks less likely to come. And what they don't understand in that calculation is what I've seen with my own eyes. When I went to um, Chickamula, Guatemala, or Zacapa, Guatemala, the people are fleeing desperation. Um, they're fleeing not only uh, persecution um, and violence, which we talk about a lot, but they're also fleeing extreme poverty, malnutrition, in some cases, starvation. Right now, it's worse than it's been, I think, in a very long time in a place like Guatemala, where I was, because of climate change, because of climate variability, like El Nino, their cash crops like coffee are drying up, um, but now also because of COVID. And unless we all realize that as Americans um, and that our country is perpetrating acts like family separation, instead of doing things like mitigating or attempting to help mitigate the crises these folks are facing on the ground, nobody wants to leave. I mean, if you, I would ask people over and over again, did you want to come here? Or did you want your sister to go to Philadelphia or daughter or brother to you know, come to New York? The answer is always no. Um, but Trump defunded aid that helps mitigate the effects of climate change in Central America. I mean, he did the exact opposite. And so that's why I call into question the motivation here um, uh, behind this policy. And that's why I say it's a choice between um, ill intent and sort of naivete. And, and I, I think I sort of tend to think it's, it's more towards uh, the former. When you so this is a this was a fast moving story and you know as you're as you're following it along, at what point did you say to yourself you know there's there's a book in here there's there's more than than what I'm doing. I still, I'm not sure. I was like, how did I? I don't honestly, and I, I don't mean to make light of it, but like, I am not a writer. Um, I never was a writer. I never worked in newspapers. I was a political advance man, um, and that's how I sort of developed my reporting technique that the author's note is called facts on the ground because that's the way that i did my reporting as a journalist i always was if you if you ever saw me on msnbc before i started doing immigration reporting heavily it was talking to talking to people talking to people about the 2016 election talking to people about their lives about the economy um, and then talking about to undocumented people about life in this country uh in that sort of predicament um and so I'm not sure I ever really, the person who encouraged me to look into writing a book was Katie Turr, my friend, and um, and my friend from growing up here in LA, but also my colleague at MSNBC. And I met, the true story is I met someone from HarperCollins at, at her book party in um, New York when her book, Unbelievable, came out in 2017. And we exchanged cards or whatever. And um, only after family separations happened did I end up reconnecting with those folks. And I, I didn't go about this I never really talked about this before publicly, but I didn't, I never really went about this as a writer trying to get a big offer or something like that. I just, I developed a relationship with Peter Hubbard, my editor, um, in the summer of 2019 when it was, I, I, at first we thought there isn't a book here. You know, this is a very dark subject. It's, it's even though it resonated in the summer of 2018 and, and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people went to the streets. I was like, I'm not sure, um, Peter, I told him this, I remember sitting there that a year from now, people are going to care. And uh, and I was wrong. In, in the summer of 2019, arguably, people cared more than they did the summer before. The Clint Border Patrol Station was overflowing. The conditions were horrific. The federal government was arguing that kids don't need toothbrushes and blankets in order to have safe and sanitary conditions. Um, and then we reported, Julia Ainsley and myself reported about abuse in the Yuma Border Patrol Station, sexual abuse allegations, um, abuse for uh, retaliatory behavior for, for complaints by migrants. Um, and that's when I went back and saw Peter again. And I said, look, people are still talking about this. And I I'm getting the feeling that sort of the way people felt a summer ago is still the way people feel. And perhaps that's the way they're going to feel a summer from now. And so we decided to, to ultimately sort of embark on this, on this book project. Um, and, uh, and it, there was no grand plan. It just sort of unfolded in that way where I didn't, um, 
like I said, I didn't take it out and try to be competitive or anything like that. I just said, I trust you. Um, they trusted me and, and we kind of just went for it. Yeah. Just to remind folks watching with us that if you have a question, um, you should type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll contact you via chat if um, to find ask you if you'd like to ask your question out loud. We're going to talk for a few more minutes and then we'll start taking a few of those questions. Um, so there's breaking news as this book is coming out. This, you know, as you mentioned, you know, people are still interested in this and also there's still developments in this story. How right. do you know, how do you know where to stop when you're writing a book like this? Um, how did I know where to stop? The truth is, if you get, um, <laughs> it's funny, I didn't know about this, but I'll show you in the book. So we have, I think, five printings because the demand was, I mean, the fact that it became a New York Times bestseller was, uh, a sh I mean, a shock as an overstatement. Um, the fact that anybody, want, honestly, that anybody wanted to read a book about immigration um, blew my mind. But if you um, look here, these little numbers on the bottom tell you what printing it is. Ultimately, we, we did five printings, but even, <laughs> I, I went up to so far, and then, so well, my point in showing you this is, in the subsequent printings, um, some of the typos that are in the original uh, first printing are not, no longer there. But I went, I went, and, and the folks at HarperCollins will tell you this, I, I sort of went up to about as far as you can go making changes. I even made um, changes once the book was typeset, having to um, lift words out character by character in order to make changes. Like Physicians for Human Rights um, declared that this was torture, I think, after I had submitted the final manuscript for sure, but maybe after the book was typeset. And I said, we have to include that um, in the story. There were reports from inspectors general that came out um, as the book was nearing its final stages with new information. I got um, emails from top officials that I included in the book at the 11th hour before this book came out. Um, and I think honestly, in the paperback version, there'll probably be new reporting and new information because subsequent to the book coming out even, um, Julia and I reported, I think last week or the week before that um, there was this bombshell meeting in the Situation Room of the White House with top cabinet level officials. And the, the sourcing for that, the idea that that story happened sort of came out of the publication of the books. You know, people coming forward saying, there's more that you don't know that's not here. And I think there's still a lot yet to be told. So I, I don't know, I'm not quite sure that this book is, I mean, the book, there's many thousands of copies out there in the world right now. Um, but I think that there's a lot more to the story that, that I wasn't able to, to get in. And I guess I kind of just stopped when, when they told me like, okay, man, time for the book to come out. Editors love it when you make changes after something's been typeset. Yeah, it's exactly. What do they call it? Oh, copy lifting, right? Or copy, uh, copy, copy lifting. I don't know. Anyway, again, I, I'm new to this, but the, the whole idea that they were like, if you do this, you have to match it exactly for characters and exactly line by line. And uh, and that's what I ended up doing. Yeah, yeah. You you mentioned at the at the beginning and throughout this conversation and throughout the book as well. You mentioned the work of others that you um, that you that you read or became aware of later. What yeah. who was whose work was really crucial to your understanding of the story? Well, I, I think my fellow journalists. Most importantly, I didn't do a lot of reading of other books about immigration or the border. In fact, virtually none while I was while I was writing this book. Um, because I wanted this to be grounded in, in the facts on the ground, in my own experience of, of what I learned and also be vulnerable. You know, I'm not afraid to admit that I, I screwed some stuff up. Um, I write in the book about how in that first kind of now like widely shared report with Chris Hayes, <laughs> I said I had been in a federal prison when in fact I was in a state prison. I mean, the, the, the for me, it was almost like a uh, therapy session in a way. It's like I, as a reporter who became so associated with this, had so much to learn. So I relied mostly on the reporting. I went back and read a lot of the reporting of the other reporters who I already mentioned who were dialed into this policy before I was. Julia Ainsley, who is now my colleague and, and very good friend, but, but then uh, was at Reuters and broke the family separation story. Um, then came Lomi Creel's incredible article um, where she uncovered this pilot program about the policy that was going on in El Paso. Um, and Lomi's now at, at ProPublica. And there's a story in the book about how I was in El Paso days after she published this story. If, at the airport, if I would have grabbed the newspaper, I probably would have learned about family separations. And instead, I drove down to Marfa, 
to that Border Patrol sector to do a story about low morale in the Border Patrol. Um, because people, you know, President Trump had wanted to hire more Border Patrol agents and these were remote destinations and he was talking very aggressively. And anyway, I just wasn't focused on the right thing. And then ultimately, Caitlin Dickerson, um, who, and Caitlin and I have actually gotten to know each other a little more since the book has come out and since I've spent more time reading her reporting. But Caitlin broke the story of 700 children. It was the first time we knew a number that had been separated by April 2018. And it was in response to that um, that Scott Lloyd had this episode where he, he wanted to destroy the list. And, and I sort of, I built a lot of the reporting I did, the actual reporting that I did in the book, not my personal story or one of Jose's story, um, off, of the, off of the work of other journalists. Because, because were it not for them, um, I don't think any of us would have really known. And were it not for the activists too. So um, I learned a lot about Im immigration reporting and reporters. And there are many, many fine immigration reporters out there. And I also learned a lot about actually, they're not journalists, but immigration attorneys and immigration activists who I now consider, you know, as important really as any first responder on any front line um, because of the work that they do and the way that they un unearth, like detectives, um, on what's really going on. Yeah. What did, what did writing this book teach you about writing? That it's hard. <laughs> I, um, this room that I'm sitting in, uh, I spent a lot more time than I ever, I like doing laundry, I really do. Um, but, I, but I spent a lot more time um, in this room than I ever would have thought um, I would. And that's because I have two little kids. I had one little, I had a son when I was covering this, but now I have a daughter um, who's six months old. Oh, congratulations. Almost. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my wife had her, not me. I think I, I end up saying all the time I had her, but we had her, my wife had her. Uh, and it's, um, I would wake up at two or three in the morning because I would have these, I didn't know where to start. You know, I started, I started the book writing about, there's a part of the book where I write about throwing up in the middle of the Arizona desert, um, going out to see these rescue beacons that the border patrol set up for migrants. And how I realized sort of my constitution was so weak compared to the people who were coming here from the most desperate circumstances on earth. Um, and that was the first thing I sort of thought to myself, that story kind of stuck out to me and I wrote it first. I didn't even know where to start. So I went to Katie Turr and I said, how did, what did you do? And she told me about Scrib Scribner, Scribner uh, an app or a program where she wrote her book in Scrivener, and yeah. I started, what's that? Scribner. Scribner, exactly. And it helped me sort of toggle between chapters and stories. And as I would think about things, I would start to write them. And once I started doing that, the book kind of took the form of a diary. It became a chronological sort of series of events. And that's when I kind of got into the flow. And so I would spend a lot of time in this room, um, on not this computer, but another one sitting right where I'm looking right now. Um, and as much as I could, um, just get time to myself and lock myself in here. Um, what I did, what I did anticipate is that Immediate, I thought I would be in Chicago right now for this book on book tour, um, but I didn't anticipate that this would turn into my television studio also and office where I'd be doing most of the talking about the book, you know, in the aftermath of the book coming out too. Yeah, we've been we've been broadcasting from my spare bedroom since uh, March, so I feel you. Have you. A nicer, you have a nicer, more dialed in background than I do. <laughs> but you have all that natural light. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, let's, um, let's take a couple of questions. Um, to remind folks, uh, if you type your question into the Q&A, um, maybe one of our uh, watch your chat window as well, one of our staff might contact you to raise your hand and ask your question yourself. Um, I'll also read out some of those questions that are, that are in our Q&A box. Our first question is from Carolyn. Hi, Carolyn. I'm unmuting myself. Am I unmuted? I hear you. How are you? Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you so much for first this book, but also for uh, coming on and, and, and chatting about it. Uh, it's fascinating. It's of particular interest to me. Um, I, I have uh, friends who are in the legal system and one who is actually involved with the courts down at the border. Um, so I, I know it's a difficult assignment because I also know reporters who have gone down there. And I'm wondering what challenges you faced as you went down there in terms of just basic communication with the individuals that you were encountering, uh, in particular, of course, Juan and Jose, but just generally. Thanks, um, good question and I appreciate that. Uh, the truth is I don't, and I write this in the book too, I, my Spanish is not very good. 
Um, and that's another, you know, it, I think a lot about it. Was I the right person to tell the story? And the answer is probably not, right? Like I'm a white privileged um, person from Southern California. And this is a, this is a story about what the American government did to, um, to largely Central American refugees. Um, but the reality is, I just ended up there for better or worse, right? Um, and I felt like it was um, important to share this story because I was there and I did have a distinct vantage point. And, you know, as far as the challenge of, I guess, being me specifically and reporting the story, I always sort of took this assignment as um, one of literally thousands of versions of this story that I think ultimately should be told. Um, every person who was separated has a story, all the officials involved in this policy have a story. Um, and so for me, in addition to the obvious sort of language barrier that I tried to overcome, um, it was reporting this story um, as someone who didn't understand it as well as other people. I wasn't in a position to understand it um, like people who had been immigration reporters for a long time or who were Central American um, American reporters who had a deeper understanding of why people would come or where they would come from or maybe had been to some of these places. Um, so I tried to focus on really what I could see with my own eyes and that's why what I wrote down in that notebook um, and my television reports were largely I approached them the way I would approach being an advance man when I was a political advance man in college. Um, I worked for Mike Bloomberg and then for Howard Dean. And the thing was always, um, in addition to Mike Bloomberg's famous line, and I, sorry if I'm, if I'm swearing or I'm about to swear, but he once said to me, don't fuck it up um, with being an advanced guy. That's the way I approach this. It sounds like Mike. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I, I would, that's what I try to do. I would try to suck up all the information that I could, repeat it back to the audience. And if you go back and watch that first report I did with Chris Hayes, for me, it was all about just answering questions that he had about what I saw. And I tried not to go beyond that. I tried not to interpret it. Of course, it was hard as a father of a young child. Um, it was very emotional for me to see this. You know, I think I probably suffered some form of PTSD, but, but, but ultimately, Carolyn, um, what I went through was nothing like what these families went through. And today, they're all still suffering the trauma of this. And they'll, they'll have... One official you'll read in the book will, will um, told me that uh, childhood trauma means a century of suffering. And that's what these kids will have for the rest of their lives. And that kind of brings me to a follow-up, if I sure. may. Um, so uh, as you said, there are many reporters down there. I know they're filing. And it's very difficult to break through under the current news climate with all the distractions. Um, what, what do you think it will take at this point to even register, and there are political reasons too, perhaps that politicians don't want it in the four, because it is a very much an issue that cleaves the population, right? So, th- but what do ahead. you think? Go ahead. Well, I think so. Although I'm not so sure that that Donald Trump, in particular, um, you know, hasn't realized that this is not a winning issue for him. What um, kind of occupied that boogeyman space in the midterm elections? in this 2016 campaign, which was migrants at the border, caravans coming, has now been replaced by um, his racism targeted towards inner cities and violence um, or his perceived violence that we're seeing in communities across the country. And I think I think that's because he knows that people now feel compassionate and discuss in ways we did not before um, issues around migration and our treatment as a country of um, of migrants. And, and that's why, uh, again, that goes back to like Juan and Jose, that's why we all wanted to participate in this project. It's why I want to have this conversation tonight. I want, obviously, I want people to buy and read the book, but I want people to, who weren't um, like me, sort of hip to what our country has been doing for decades, if not generations, have a deeper understanding of how we got to this point. It's why it's called Separated Inside an American Tragedy, as I said, because this is us, this is who we are, this is being done in our name. And if we don't learn more about it and talk about it and not be afraid to say, frankly, we got here because of Democrats and Republicans, um, we're never gonna get anywhere. And also to find out what is going on in terms of COVID infection and death at the border. There is, I've seen pitiful little on that. 
Yeah, and just quickly on that, I mean, I've done some reporting uh, again with Julia about the conditions inside detention. There are still children today, I think 91 is the latest number who are locked up in ICE detention with their families where there's COVID, the government refuses to release them mm -hmm. and gives them the choice of either being separated from their parents and released to somebody else um, or being detained indefinitely. And so the Trump administration is today doing what they wanted to do all along, indefinitely detain families uh, and kick kids out of the country immediately when they get here by holding them in hotels with little um, oversight, no access to lawyers um, and, and really no due process. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Chad. Chad, would you like to? Is it Chad Wolf, the acting secretary of Homeland Security? It is not. Okay. <laughs> not. I'm, Chad I'm Rebell. Good, hey, Chad. I, I'm a good Chad, just so. <laughs> um, all right, Chad. Doing, doing well. First of all, thanks for doing this. And in terms of like the book itself, like this appeared. So the fact that your book is out and you're talking about it, means the story is still alive. So thanks for that as well. Thanks, Chad. The question I had was that it seemed like at the time that you had people coming to the border and going, I have a relative in Texas or I have a relative in California, like an actual contact so yeah. that the kids didn't have to be in these cages, didn't have to be in these stories. Is the previous things that you talked about, was that an issue where, oh, but if there's a connection then they can sort of move on to that connection and that the Trump people didn't do that. Or was this just that they were like, we're going to stop everybody. Cause it seemed like the logical thing was, Hey, there's a relative who can take care of them. And then the story was, well, we can't verify this or just, you know, they're just blowing smoke. So can you speak to some of that as far as yeah. what Trump has done? And if it happened that poorly in any other point, can you also speak to that as well? Sure. The, a couple of things. One is, it's a good question. The government would often allege uh, the reason they needed to separate families was people came as fraudulent families, right? Like some guy came claiming this kid was his kid and it's not really his kid. And well, I think maybe on occasion that happened. And I think I probably witnessed that um, in doing all my reporting on the border over the years, at least once. Um, there's one instance that sticks out to me. Uh, is a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall cases. And they use that as justification, just like everything else, MS-13, you know, um, coming here and exploding numbers, which really was like 100 of 187,000 or something, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, so they were sort of cooking the books on that fraudulent family issue. And then separately, yeah, a lot of people come here because they have family here. Um, but in this case in particular, I think a lot of unaccompanied children were coming to this country during the Obama administration, which is when they built that facility with the cages. They had a surge of children, they were kept there, and those kids would then be later placed with family members in the interior. Um, they call them sponsors. But what's important to know about separations is the children should have never ended up in the system or the pipeline that was going to take them to other family members or sponsors because they arrived with their parents. Historically, the government would take families that arrived in that category, um, process them, detain them for no longer than 20 days under what's called the Flores Settlement Agreement, which they're violating right now, um, and then release them to the interior as they awaited their asylum cases and the adjudication of those cases. And that was their problem all along. They called that catch and release. And the government thought, well, if we separate them, that's going to, and this is what Katie Waldman, Katie Miller told me point blank, that it would scare them, deter them, scare the shit out of them so that other families don't come and force Congress to change the laws. And so family separation all along was their reaction to the idea that these families would go to the interior because now they're arriving as families, not as individual children who are, as you said, um, trying to get to another family member oftentimes who's here in the United States. We have a, a question from the, uh, from the Q and A box that I want, wanted to ask from Eric. Sure. He writes, immigration law is extremely complex, even for a lawyer. Without any yeah. legal training, to what extent did you review or study the INA? Or, sorry, I lost the, the question, but it was about to, to what extent did you, um, you know, study law or study the laws or have someone sort of guide you through that process? Uh, don't ever hire me as your lawyer. Um, but I, I, in all seriousness, I spent a lot of time 
um, getting to know and talking to a lot of immigration lawyers. And I still, to this day, probably every week, I'm talking to immigration lawyers about one thing or another um, all over the country. Um, and uh, in particular, in the story, where it's really relevant is, and this was exclusively reported in my book, the document was never seen, um, the contents of the document were never seen before I published it in my book. But Kirsten Nielsen, the Secretary of Homeland Security, was warned by her general counsel, John Mitnick, uh, that signing the memo to put this policy into place would possibly be violative of uh, not only the INA, um, which, which you mentioned, but also the Administrative Procedures Act, the way that laws, rules, regulations are made, and also um, the Fifth Amendment, the Due Process Clause of the Constitution. And so, I mean, that is because that piece of news was in the book, just that in particular, I stopped and I spent an extraordinary amount of time talking with um, the lawyers who worked on this case. Um, Legal Learnt, the main lawyer from the ACLU, who um, through the Miss L case, ultimately won the an injunction to stop separations and the reunification of, of this class of kids, which now numbers over 5,400, 5,500, I think, um, has, has, taught, has taught me so much. But then there are lawyers that are representing individual cases in the proceedings. I already mentioned Lin Lindsay Toslowski, but whether it's um, Raices uh, down in Texas um, or a small shop like Immigrant Defenders um, or Kind Kids in Need of Defense um, or the Women's Refugee Commission um, or Justice in Motion. I mean, these are groups that are today still on the ground in Central America trying to locate um, unknown parents and children who were separated. Um, they've taught me so much, but I think they would probably tell you too, they would never want me as a fellow immigration lawyer. I'll stick to the reporting of what they find out in, the, in the, their understanding of the law. Yeah. We have a question from uh, Loretta. Loretta, hey, Loretta. Like to... Hello. There you go. Thank you. And thank you for um, writing this. I haven't had the opportunity, but I followed the story. And as a parent, I wanted to ask you what you think this policy how it will affect your children in the future because it went against the spirit of America, also the laws. Well, I hope personally, my children um, and my my son, who's four and a half now, um, you know, I tried to explain a little bit to him about what happened, but he's very young, which makes me sick to think about that they separated, you know, um, over 300 children who were under five years old um, as part of this policy. Um, I hope he understands this in the way that we're talking about it one day too, that our country, that, that one day that this story, um, and I'm talking about my book, I'm talking about the story of what the Trump administration did will be remembered um, in a long series of really ignoble events, including um, the original sins of the country like Native American genocide and slavery, um, and then later Japanese internment um, uh, Jim Crow, I mean, you name it. Um, this was a deliberate attempt by the U.S. government to damage children, and they'll say it wasn't, um, but how do, you, how do you look at this, learn what I learned in writing a 418-page book about it, um, and believe anything otherwise? I mean, the incompetence is staggering, um, the negligence is staggering, but this is not a book and not a story just about negligence um, and incompetence. Um, and so, and so that, that's what I hope they learn. And like I said, there's, there's over 54, 5,500 children who um, will be living in this country um, if their asylum cases are, are, are adjudicated in their favor, um, who, will be, who will be like with every other um, horrific event in our history, uh, sort of the, the living, um, breathing history lesson about what our country did. And, and, and so when it comes to children, there's no children that will be able to tell the story more than they will. I'd like to, we have time for one more question and I'd like to take this one from the, the Q&A box um, from Anthony. Uh, he writes, as the first generation son of immigrants from Mexico, immigration has always been in the forefront of my mind. Currently, I'm taking a social justice writing class to finish off my English minor, and we're assigned a final project regarding a political and social issue of our choosing. As someone looking to weave both personal experience and research into a piece of writing, how do you find the balance between the two? 
Um, thanks, Anthony, and good luck on this project. Um, how did I find the balance? I think you got to keep yourself in check. And um, I'm still self-conscious that like, is that I put too much of what I went through um, in this story. Um, but I think whether it's you or somebody else, um, for me, the reason I included my vantage point um, is because there's a lot of talk about objectivity and neutrality and how do you report a story, um, you know, from a vantage point that doesn't have an opinion. I don't believe that that's possible. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know that my, my bosses would love that I say that, um, but that's the truth. And I think that no person um, comes to any experience without their own lived experience, without their own vantage point, uh, without their own identity. And I felt that it was important to include who I am and what I went through um, as the teller of this story. And so that's what I did. I just laid it out chronologically. And I said, here are these formative, important moments for me. Um, here are these moments in my reporting that I learned about. And here's the story of Juan and Jose. And then I laid them all on top of each other. And it really, and it really presented a much fuller picture than I had ever understood before. And I don't think I would have been able to do that um, if I tried to sort of phonally, fakely um, come to this uh, in some way that was like, quote unquote, neutral. It's like with the cages. When I walked outside of the McAllen Border Patrol Processing Station, I didn't stop and say, hmm, uh, should I call them batting cages, dog kennels? I just said, they're, these are cages. And um, what I would do, um, I guess, I don't know if you're asking for advice, but what I did was I didn't sort of um, moderate or, or govern uh, the way that I, I wrote about my own personal experience. I just did it. And then I went back and I, I did it. I took some stuff out. Um, I probably overwrote about me, um, but um, but then you, can, you always have the ability to dial it back and just trust yourself because like you said, you come as a first generation immigrant with your own set of lived experience and that informs who you're writing. Um, and I don't think you should try to, I mean, I know I'm very confident in it that to not try to acknowledge that and make it a part of who you are in your work um, wouldn't do justice to, to your story. So thanks. And thank you, Jacob, for being here with us tonight and for um, for sharing so much of the background of this book with us. The, the book is separated inside an American tragedy and we'll put the link up in the chat to order from our bookseller partner at Seminary Co-op. Uh, I know there were a lot of questions in the Q&A we didn't get to, so I wanna thank everyone for their yeah, interest thanks. and their enthusiasm. And um, if, you're, if you're watching us tonight, we're gonna leave the, leave the uh, webinar going for a little while so you can copy the, that link out of the chat. But Jacob, thank you very much for being with, here with us. Allison, thank you. And thank you to the uh, American Writers Museum. And hi to all my friends in Chicago. And, uh, and I'm grateful to, to everybody who came to, this, uh, to the chat tonight. So have a good evening, everybody. Thank you.